a big fan of the Planet of the Apes movies, but the Maya scene was a true, real, bona fide Planet of the Apes. But before we can really consider the insane diversity of apes seen during this time period, we really have to understand what it is that separates apes, or members of the superfamily Hominoidea, from other types of Old World monkeys, or catarines. Back before the advent of genetics, early taxonomists typically used morphology, or physical characteristics, to group organisms into taxonomic ranks. This was troubling for many early scientists, as the set of physical characteristics that separated living apes like chimpanzees and gorillas from the other Old World monkeys clearly applied to humans as well, firmly cementing us as members of the ape family Hominidae and the ape superfamily Hominoidea. So what characteristics designate an ape? Most obviously, apes lack prominent tails. We also have broad chests, mobile shoulders, oriented dorsally, with short, stiff lower backs whose vertebra have robust pedicles, and long clavicles that support our orthograde or upright posture. We have mobile wrists and more primitive teeth when compared to old world monkeys, a unique appendix, a deeply arched palate, small incisive foramina, and larger brain sizes for our body size. Living apes have a wide range of sexual dimorphism, from monomorphic gibbons and humans to extremely dimorphic gorillas and orangutans, and we often use tools to accomplish tasks. Many living apes also have cultures in that they pass down skills with some arbitrary rules that are population-specific to their offspring. In their locomotion, living apes are also highly diverse. Suspensory adaptations, high-speed brachiation, knuckle-walking quadrupedalism, and obligate terrestrial bipedality all characterize the superfamily. Evolution makes a relatively simple hypothesis then. The very first apes should look and move a lot like the monkeys living at the time period, but they should have a few precursors that will align them with the later Miocene apes and eventually through to the living apes. Now, the apes of the Miocene will be found all across Africa, permeating up into Europe and spreading far east into Asia. But it does seem that the early apes of the Miocene epoch were East African in origin. Proconsul is known primarily from its remains at Rusinga Island, where it has been well characterized, but this ancient ape has also been found in many places in East Africa, and its ape traits make it stick out like a sore thumb as a stem hominoid. Sporting a tailless form, Proconsul and its cousin Akembo have gracile skulls with only moderate mid-facial prognathism and low alveolar prognathism. They have larger brains than their contemporaneous monkey kin with incisors that are adapted for fruit consumption. They have cane nine teeth with a premolar honing complex, that constant honing keeps them sharp, and male canines are around 50% larger than female canines, perhaps suggesting a social system with high male competition. This honing complex is highest in Proconsul africanus and the lowest in Akembo hesaloni when considering members of the Proconsulidae family. The postcrania of these apes continue the trend of primarily Old World monkey characteristics, but a handful of ape traits. They only have medial torsion of the humeral head and a long and curved back with a narrow chest, much like protograde monkeys do today. However, like apes, they have a long thumb, although it is non-rotary, as well as a powerful flexor for branch gripping, and of course, they lack a tail. So by and large, Proconsul and Akembo are looking like and moving like the monkeys of their day, albeit they do have a handful of characteristics that we find in all later apes, and of course, obviously, they lack a tail. Based on the microwear of their teeth, we know that Proconsul and Akembo were primarily frugivorous. They're eating a lot of fruit, and interestingly enough, it looks like their teeth finished developing by the time they were age seven. Alongside Proconsul and Akembo was a genus known as Rongwapithecus. This ape by and large looked very similar to Proconsul and Akembo, with the primary differences being found in its teeth. Rongwapithecus is noted as being monomorphic in its canine teeth, meaning males and females had canines of the same height, much like gibbons or humans or tamarins or marmosets do, and that these canine teeth were blade-like and adapted for shearing. This suggests that Rongwapithecus invested in folivory as well as frugivory, and that its social system may have been oriented around single-pair family groups. However, caution must be exercised as sexual dimorphism or lack thereof can only be appropriately assessed with sufficient sample sizes of teeth or post Crania. Case in point, there was originally a lot of debate around the proconsul fossils found at Rusinga Island as to whether or not there were two sexes or two species present. 
The fossils clustered into two sizes, with one ranging from 8 to 14 kilograms, or around the size of a modern-day Saimang, while the other ranged from 28 to 46 kilograms, around the size of a modern chimpanzee. The original question regarding these fossils is whether or not they represented two species of fossil ape, with one being small and the other being large, or a single, extremely sexually dimorphic species. If the latter was true, this would make Proconsul the most sexually dimorphic primate known to exist, with the largest males being nearly six times the size of the smallest females. Extensive work through the decades, both paleontological and statistical, supports the idea pretty robustly that what we're looking at here is two distinct ape species. The smaller species, which is known as Proconsul africanus, and a larger species known as Akembo nyanze, formerly called Proconsul nyanze. Even larger is Proconsul major, which was about the size of the largest modern-day chimpanzees. But the early Miocene was home to more than just Proconsul, Akembo, and Rongwapithecus. Micropithecus is known for its diminutive size, as it is an ape that was roughly the size of a modern-day capuchin monkey. This means that Micropithecus is the smallest ape known to have ever lived. Dendropithecus was originally thought to have been a relative of Gibbons due to its morphology lending itself to brachiation as well as its long and scimitar-like canine teeth. However, now it is considered to be a stem ape. Limnopithecus, similarly, is thought to have been gibbon-like, although whether or not this ancient animal is an ancestor of modern hylobatids has yet to be seen. It may be more likely than Dendropithecus, however, as Limnopithecus is thought to be monomorphic in its large canine teeth, just like modern hylobatids. Nyansopithecus is another potential gibbon relative, although the consensus is currently that small apes appear to have convergently evolved gibbon-like facial features, given these three species lack definitive hylobatid synapomorphies. Morotopithecus is known from Uganda and is considered to be more derived than Proconsul, although some have lumped it into the same species as the later Afropithecus. This ape had shorter, stronger femora that seemed to suggest that it was adept at vertical climbing. Afropithecus turkinensis is a unique hominid from the early Miocene in that, like Rongwapithecus, it is thought to be monomorphic based off of the canines of sex specimens. Males and females of this large ape both had enormous tusk-like canine teeth that are considered to be laterally splayed or jutting out a bit sideways. This is similar to what we see in modern members of Pythiceinae, New World monkeys who use their large canines like can openers when feeding. These monkeys live in large polygamous groups, like many sexually dimorphic monkeys do, but there is pressure for both sexes to have large canine teeth in order to feed properly. This means, in the case of Afropithecus turkinensis, that social system remains mysterious. These apes, like our previous cast of characters, were also palmigrade arboreal quadrupeds. One trend you may be noticing is that a lot of these apes, even if they're medium to large bodied, appear to be moving a lot like monkeys do, on top of the branches as arboreal quadrupeds. Peter Andrews notes in his book, An Ape's View of Human Evolution, that this was the condition for three-fourths of the ape evolutionary journey. Quadrupedal, monkey-like adaptations with high frugivory and a habitat that is characterized by open canopy woodland rather than jungles or rainforests. At this point in time, Europe is really beginning to heat up, opening up an entire new range for the Miocene apes, which had originally evolved in East Africa. This means that around 16 million years ago, the apes could finally leave Africa for the first time of many. Subtropical forests expanded into the Arabian Peninsula and up throughout Europe, additionally paving a way out east into Asia. Simultaneously, the collision of the continental plates gave rise to a land bridge that spanned the Tethys Sea and allowed faunal exchange between Europe and Africa. The Miocene apes had brand new real estate right at their disposal. Afropithecus, our monomorphic sclerocarpic feeder, is thought to have given rise to the Griefopiths, a group of strong-jawed apes that would be the very first out of Africa. Heliopithecus is the oldest ape found outside of geopolitical Africa at 17 million years ago, calling Ad Dabtia, Saudi Arabia, home. Not much can be attributed to this ape, but the dental material found is a dead ringer for an ancient hominoid. 
Griefelpithecus is the oldest ape outside of continental Africa at 16.5 million years ago and can be found in Pasilar and Kandir, modern-day Turkey. Unlike its probable ancestor, Afropithecus, Griefelpithecus was highly sexually dimorphic and known for its derived teeth and jaws. This ape's enamel is thick, suggesting a diet of harder, tougher foods, and it lacks cingula, or ridges, on its molars. This makes it well adapted for crushing and grinding rather than shearing, meaning Griefelpithecus was likely exploiting fruit and nuts rather than leaves. However, outside of its jaws and teeth, it's still very primitive. Griefelpithecus moved around on the tops of tree branches more like monkeys than true apes. The environment it lived in was harsher than that of the African apes, dry woodlands with fruits that could probably only be exploited seasonally. It was well equipped with strong jaws to fall back on tougher materials such as nuts or unripe fruits when need be. While Griefelpithecus was expanding out of Africa, another hominoid, or potentially even a hominid, stayed closer to home. Equatorius could be found on Maboko Island on Lake Victoria, where it dwelled in mixed forest habitats. It may have been more terrestrial than contemporaneous apes given its less dense environment, a notion supported by its hip morphology, which is similar to modern primates with terrestrial habitats like baboons or macaques. Also in Africa was Kenyapithecus, who was like Griefopithecus in nearly every way. However, where Kenyapithecus sticks out is in its face. This animal had zygomatics placed high above the jaws, as well as unique incisors. What this means functionally has yet to be seen. Nakalopithecus maintained African tenure as well and is known from a spectacular skeleton that preserves much of the animal. Nakalopithecus is beginning to show signs of an ape-like locomotor pattern in its spine. The transverse process of the lumbar vertebra are angled towards the back rather than the belly. However, this ape still maintained the narrow, classical monkey ribcage. Far to the west and in the south of the African continent, Otavi Pithecus can be found. It doesn't have much material to its name, but the preserved morphology is much like Proconsul, a much earlier, more ancient ape. It has thus been suggested that Otavi Pithecus is a dead-end hominoid, a radiation from Proconsul that journeyed far from home and went extinct in a strange land. So far, all of these apes are still maintaining the general monkey locomotor pattern. Above branch, palmigrade, promigrade, arboreal quadrupedalism, which is a mouthful. And this is gleaned from their morphology, that of the spine and the rib cage, as mentioned previously. But the limbs support this idea as well. Modern monkeys cannot fully extend their arms at the elbow, opting for stability rather than flexibility. Similarly, their wrists are stiff mediolaterally. All preserved arm and wrist material from the apes mentioned thus far matches this pattern. They have many characteristics of all modern apes, and yet no modern monkeys have, but the ape locomotor suite has not entirely arrived on the scene just yet. David Begun, in his book The Real Planet of the Apes, suspects that the first great ape, or the first hominid, appeared in Europe. As the Miocene climatic maximum arrived some 14 million years ago, Europe had not yet been settled by the apes. But a mere one and a half million years later, at 12.5 million years ago, we find Dryopithecus in France. This ape is starkly different from the others we've talked about in this video. In the warm and mild forests of Europe, it evidently committed entirely to softer fruits that were available year-round. Its teeth are chimp-like, with thin enamel and large incisors. Its lumbar vertebra are decidedly ape-like, and its wrists are highly mobile, suggesting a locomotor style more like an orangutan than a monkey. This would be the ancestral stock from which the rest of the European apes would seemingly specialize from. Out east, we find traces of an ape in Thailand. Coropithecus is known from very little material, but what we have looks very similar to modern orangutans. For instance, modern orangs have a mandibular feature known as the anterior digastric, which can be found in Coropithecus, but no other Miocene ape thus far. By the end of the Middle Miocene, some 11.5 million years ago, the apes were stretched well into Eurasia. Back home in Africa, they continued to thrive as the mild Miocene climate nurtured their ideal habitats. However, far underneath the ocean, currents were changing. This upset would set off a climatic domino effect that would eventually lead to the Miocene climatic disruption and the return of heavy seasonality in Europe. This has been dubbed the Valesian Crisis, as the forests which the apes and numerous other animals depended on shrunk and eventually disappeared. 
Before the extinction fell into full swing, however, the late Miocene would yield some fascinating apes, some of which carry the characteristics that define the first hominins in our own evolutionary line. Eurasia was the late Miocene apes playground. Warm forests and wetlands abounded from as far north as Germany to Spain in the west and China in the east. Apes were everywhere. Back in Africa, they were likely still egging out a living, but the fossil record from this time period is scarce to say the least. The same, thankfully, is not the case for Asia and Europe. The climate was cooling, but it was doing so slowly. 12.5 million years ago, the lineage that would lead to modern orangutans was making its way eastward. Shiva Pithecus could be found in Pakistan, India, and Nepal, and has a characteristically orangutan face, oval-shaped orbit seated close together with a clinorhynchic or dished form. Like its probable progenitor species from back in Europe, it had long molars without cingula and large incisors. This ape is well represented in the fossil record, which makes interpreting its postcrania strangely more difficult. Unlike modern orangutans, the postcrania of Shivapithecus are decidedly non-suspensory, instead looking much more like the monkey-like apes from the early and middle Miocene. Ankharopithecus is similar to Shivapithecus, albeit with a more primitive premaxilla, and could be found in Turkey at around 10 million years ago, where the Griefapiths were calling home. Deep in modern China, the remains of Lufeng Pithecus can be dated from 6 to 8 million years ago. This ape is strange in many ways. It is potentially the most sexually dimorphic ape of all time, on the level of modern-day mandrels, with males being perhaps five times the size of females. Its postcrania look much like a standard pongin, and it boasts the same crenulated molars, but the face looks much more similar to modern gorillas. This has left paleoanthropologists to wonder whether Lufeng Pithecus is a late migrating European ape, more closely related to the African apes than Shiva Pithecus and company, or simply a late surviving primitive pongin. Of course, we would be remiss to discuss the Asian apes and not mention the mighty Gigantopithecus. This enormous ape was three times the size of a modern male silverback gorilla. We know it primarily from jaws and teeth, the molars of which reveal its diet. Gigantopithecus primarily ate bamboo, but the cavity frequency suggests sweet fruits were also on the menu whenever possible. It was evidently sexually dimorphic, but not particularly so in the canine teeth, suggesting males may have competed using larger body sizes instead. This ape lived from 1 million years ago to a mere 100,000 years ago, meaning members of our own species may have encountered this massive cousin. Europe boasted its own cast of fascinating apes. In the deep forests of Spain 9 to 10 million years ago, Hispanopithecus likely led a life similar to modern chimpanzees. These apes had long arms and likely used them to navigate the deep canopies of vegetation. They are very sexually dimorphic, around the level of modern chimpanzees and bonobos, suggesting a social system that was likely similar to these panins. Like chimps and bonobos, they additionally had brow ridges and continuous sinuses. Also in Spain was Pierolopithecus. This ape shares much with the earlier Dryopithecus, but is thought by some to be the ancestor of all modern African apes, panins, gorillans, and hominins. This is usually put forward on the basis of its general morphology, which includes a wide, flat ribcage, a stiff lower spine, flexible wrists, and shoulder blades that lie dorsally. That being said, many of the European apes have these qualities, and the ancestor of all modern African apes being a resident of the Iberian Peninsula 13 million years ago feels a bit unlikely. In the east of Hungary, Rudopithecus likely lived in a similar way as well, as it too had lower sexual dimorphism and a morphology well suited for an arboreal lifestyle. Rudopithecus had a larger brain than Hispanopithecus and a clinorhynchic face more similar to modern African apes like the panins, gorillans, and hominins. In Germany, Denuvius is considered to be an extended limb clamberer, with adaptations to both arboreal bipedalism and suspensory clambering. It had a strong grip in both its hands and feet and weighed an average of around 50 pounds, larger than a siamang but smaller than a bonobo. Sexual dimorphism for this ape is again thought to be chimp-like. A small island off the coast of modern Italy housed an isolated ape known as Oreopithecus. This animal had few predators, which may explain why it had a smaller brain for its body size than even some of the older Miocene apes. Its canines are smaller than other European cousins, and its molars are high cusped, suggesting a dependence on leaves rather than fruits. Like the other European apes, though, Oreopithecus had long arms and a locomotor pattern to match. 
In Greece, a larger bodied ape known as Oronopithecus could be found. This ape also had reduced canines, curiously exhibiting the pattern seen in the later Ardipithecus. The mandibular or lower canines are larger than the maxillary or upper canines, almost tusk like. Oronopithecus had large jaws with thick enamel on the molars, again suggesting a hard object feeding style. It was also highly sexually dimorphic, unlike the other late Miocene European apes. Lastly, there is Gracopithecus. This ape is known from very little material, but that has not stopped some paleoanthropologists from suggesting it is the oldest ape on the human lineage. The Miocene apes thrived for millions of years in Eurasia, but around 7 million years ago, they really began to disappear. The climate was changing again, and the forests were shrinking, leaving Africa and Southeast Asia as basically the only safe havens for these enigmatic primates. Southeast Asia would boast the Pongins, orangutans, and their kin, as well as Gigantopithecus and oodles and oodles of gibbons. The gibbon fossil record, unfortunately, is notoriously spotty, which is why we haven't really discussed it too much, although I did do a video on Yuanmopithecus a while back, which is an excellent fossil. In Africa, gorillans and panins would stick to the jungle, they would stick to what they knew. But in other places, apes would do something very strange indeed. They would stand up, and these apes would become the hominins. They would become us.